Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. On the 31st of August, which is about six or seven weeks ago, I was uh, in a car driving up the F3 on my way to the University of Newcastle to deliver this speech, to deliver what I expect that would just be, you know, a little talk that I was giving at a regional university that, you know, ten people would listen to and that would be that. <laughs> um, and I, I heard a, re a report, uh, I can't remember now whether it was on the radio or whether it was on Twitter, but, some but somehow I learnt during my drive up to Newcastle that Alan Jones had uh, been at a an anti-Clover Moore demonstration at the town hall that very morning and he'd made this complaint that women were destroying the joint. <laughs> and I just thought it was worth reflecting that in the, uh, the few weeks since the 31st of August until today, the 17th of October, just what has happened, uh, not only with that phrase, uh, which has uh, uh, become a political movement, one which has very successfully prosecuted one of the best um, boycott actions we've probably ever seen in this country, um, uh, but also the way in which um, my speech has kind of taken off and all of the other events which have, uh, Louise has mentioned, which have occurred since. Um, and particularly uh, the highlight last week of the Prime Minister's amazing speech. But just to tell you um, what's happened with this speech, as I say, I expected it to be a one-off delivered you know, in, a, in a regional city and that would be that. I'd hoped, you know, I put it up on Facebook and mentioned on Twitter and hoped that my followers would look at it. But since the 5th of September when we put it up on my website, um, we've well, had um, 127,831 page views of the site. Um, I've had 72,605 unique visitors. That's the number of people who've just read it on the speech. And we've had 18,731 people come back for a second or more look. Um, these are absolutely phenomenal figures for my website. I normally get about 60 people a day if I'm lucky. And now, particularly after the mention in the New Yorker the other day, I got 10,000 in one day. And all this for a speech which Andrew Bolt yesterday described as absurd. <laughs> <laughs> so I know some of you have probably already read it, but um, um, I just what I'm going to, and so you know what I'm going to talk about, but let me just spell it out for you one more time. And what I'm going to be doing in this lecture is examining what I contend is the sexist and discriminatory treatment of Australia's first female Prime Minister by the opposition and by some elements in uh, Australian society. And as Louise has mentioned, I'm going to be, there is a, um, a bit of a slideshow and Louise has agreed to be the barrel girl <laughs> because I'm very hopeless at, at that sort of, at, at managing PowerPoints. Uh, there are some confronting images, but in addition to that, um, I'm going to be using some quite confronting language. So. Um, I just want to warn you of that. If you think you're likely to be offended, now's the time to head for the exits. On the 24th of June 2010, Julia, Julia Eileen Gillard became Australia's first female Prime Minister. She'd served as Deputy Prime Minister to Kevin Rudd in the Labor government that was elected on the 24th of November 2007. As Deputy Prime Minister, or DPM as it's known, she had enjoyed enormous popularity and although the means by which Gillard had assumed the top job was controversial and became more so over the course of time, initially her elevation was greeted with widespread enthusiasm. There was a palpable sense of history in the media coverage, with most outlets treating Gillard's ascension as an important event to be taken seriously. The public seemed pretty pleased as well. Her popularity rating was high. Women and girls especially were thrilled at this milestone having been reached. Gillard has said that women who were just so happy to see a woman running our country sent her gifts, often jewellery. And Gillard has said that she always tried to wear these pieces of jewellery at least once and at an event where she would be photographed so that the giver could see just how much she appreciated that gesture. Just a few weeks into the job, Gillard called an election seeking to legitimise her position through the validation of a popular vote. That election, held on the 21st of August 2010, failed to deliver her an outright majority. However, she was able to form a government by negotiating agreements with the Greens and what were then three independents. In order to secure a deal with the Greens, Gillard had to agree to introduce a price on carbon and thereby break a commitment she had made during the campaign that there would be, and I quote, no carbon tax under a government that I lead. Other Prime Ministers have changed policies or gone back on promises. 
Paul Keating did not proceed with the LAW tax cuts. John Howard, start again. John, it's okay. John Howard um, introduced a GST. Both are accused of backflips or of breaking promises. Neither was ever called a liar. And I just make the comment there because a lot of people have come back at me on this point, including um, Gerard Henderson in great detail in his website and the Herald yesterday. Um, I know that other Prime Ministers have been called liars, but generally it's for telling lies. It's not for changing... <laughs> <laughs> not for having changed their mind on policies. I really think there is a distinction that a lot of the commentators are absolutely refusing to grasp. What has happened with Gillard, however, is that the notion that she is, in quote unquote, a liar, has become so extraordinarily entrenched that it is no longer at all controversial to refer to her in this way. The term Jew liar seems to have been coined by broadcaster Alan Jones and quickly adopted by opponents of Gillard. It featured prominently on banners at a rally protesting the carbon tax that took place in Canberra in March 2011. This particular demonstration, which was part of the um, so-called Convoy of No Confidence rally in Canberra, was the first time that many of us were exposed to the virulence of the attacks that were beginning to be made against Gillard. It was the first time we saw her referred to as Bob Brown's bitch. And it was the first time we saw the slogan, Ditch the Witch. Little did we know that this was just the beginning. Over the past two years, Tony Abbott has relentlessly used Gillard's backflip on the carbon tax to depict her as unreliable, as untrustworthy and as a liar. The notion that the Prime Minister is a liar has now been firmly planted in the public mind. Hello, g'day. I've just heard the man out there saying no one's asked about the carbon tax. Oh, I think it's probably one of our mediums. This one oh, here. Yeah. Uh, hello. I said I'd just like to ask one. Sure. Why did you lie to us? Right. Well, I can talk to you And why that. are you continuing well, to lie and say, well, you know, I didn't really mean to lie. Well, I, I can explain all of that to you. Oh, I've listened to you for months. I've watched Parliament. Yeah. You're so, still lying. Well, I can give you an answer right now if you'll let me. Uh, what I want to do is put a price on carbon pollution. Big polluters get a part. I understand. Yeah. So let do something. Let me see if I can just finish so we'll, we'll have less of it in the atmosphere. I understand that. Which is a good thing. There's two, two main I'm not stupid. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. Two ways of doing it. One is effectively a tax, a fixed price. Oh, Julia, I've heard you, I've heard you on q and A. I. I've heard you for over a year. Yep. But the thing that sticks in my craw is you stood up and said there will be no carbon tax. And I was talking And a few months later, yeah. it's all coming out, excuse me. A few months later, you've changed your mind. No, I haven't changed my mind. No, that's, if I can explain well, that, that. I did say, I did talk in the election campaign about the need to put a price yeah. on carbon. And I did yeah. get out what's called a cap and trade scheme where you cap the amount of carbon. And then at the very election. end you said, yes. there will be no did, carbon I tax did. under my government. Absolutely, I did say that. I talked in the election campaign about putting a cap on carbon pollution and emissions trading scheme. We're going to get there by a temporary yeah. carbon tax to where I talked about during the election yeah. campaign. So it's a different route home than the one I thought we were going same to use, outcome. but we'll same get to the same outcome. 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 Exactly. Same outcome. Outcome. Well, well, I didn't. Well, I didn't mean to mislead and I didn't foresee all of the circumstances of this parliament. But, um, you know, we're going to get there well, to do the right thing by our When you get in by manipulation, I'm sure... It's not so good. Well, yeah, you're, you're making an assumption. Didn't make them as well anyway. We're going to get where I wanted to go. Yeah, well, when you start telling the truth, I'll listen to you. Well, that was. That was. Okay. Hello. 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 But on August the 20th, the Deputy Speaker heard him and demanded he withdraw because he called her a liar. It is unparliamentary to call someone a liar. As you probably recall, Abbott's withdrawal was qualified, so much so that he was thrown out of Parliament for an hour, becoming the first leader of the opposition to be ejected from the House since the mid-1980s. This might all be part of the normal cut and thrust of politics, 
Most observers of Canberra uh, today agree that the current political environment has become especially toxic. The hung parliament and the expectation on the part of the opposition that it is just one lost vote on the floor of the House away from government has raised the stakes to levels not previously seen in Australian politics. As a result, we are experiencing an era in politics where there is very little civility. The overall temperature of discussion and debate is torrid and people use language towards and about each other that even a few years ago would have been considered totally out of line. This sadly is the new norm. But what is not normal is the way in which the Prime Minister is attacked, vilified or demeans, demeaned in ways that are specifically <coughs> related to her sex or, if you like, her gender. Calling her, her a liar might not be gender specific, although, as I have pointed out, it was not a term used against backflipping male Prime Ministers. There are countless examples, however, where the Prime Minister is attacked, vilified or demeaned in ways that do specifically relate to her sex, and I propose to devote the rest of this lecture to describing, categorising and exploring the implications of them. Some of the examples are benign in the sense that they are examples of a double standard, of a woman being treated less seriously than a man of a similar status would be. The most obvious and frequent example is the way in which the Prime Minister is almost always referred to as Julia. I offer as an example the banner headline in the Australian, uh, which is on the, I think on the 20th of August, just a week before I gave this, initially gave this lecture, during the reporting of the Slater and Gordon matter. And this was, uh, I think, on the uh, front section of the second part of the paper on Saturday. And the headline in huge letters was what Julia told her firm. Now, have you ever seen a headline saying what John told or what Paul told? No, you haven't for the simple reason the previous Prime Ministers were accorded the basic respect of being referred to by their last names. There is a similar lack of respect in the way the Federal Opposition constantly used the female pro pronoun to refer to the Prime Minister. Tony Abbott is a serial offender, constantly referring just to she or her in his press conferences, but he's not the only one. And there was a very uh, famous exchange, which I won't bother to repeat here, in Federal Hansard during question time on the 21st of August, when the Prime Minister was answering a question and Christopher Pine, as Manager of Opposition Business, interrupted on a point of order and said to the Speaker, you know, she is not answering the question. This is politics, you might say, everyone is fair game, perhaps. But should our politicians be the ones to lower the threshold of what is acceptable commentary about each other? Sadly, too many of them are, in ways that affect all women MPs as well as the Prime Minister. I was told um, just in, in August, in fact the week that I first gave this speech, by a federal MP that, 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 that there is what she called misogynist corner on the coalition benches. This is a bunch of members, all of them male, who she said positively bray whenever a female frontbencher from the government goes to the dispatch box to give an answer. And it's not just the men. Opposition frontbencher Sophie Mirabella has been known to call out, here comes the weather girl, when Kate Ellis, who as you all know is young and attractive and is the Minister for Employment Participation, Early Childhood and Child Care, goes to answer a question. Should our politicians be setting higher standards? I think they should, for the simple fact that it is now possible to posit that this conduct is having a negative influence on the national conversation. I know countless instances of people who routinely use terms like lying bitch when speaking about the Prime Minister. What we are seeing now has gone way beyond derogatory comments about her clothes, her accent, her arse, to quote Jermaine Greer, or even her earlobes, the comments that many of us found offensive only a year ago. The threshold is being progressively lowered, so much so that it is pretty much now in the gutter if not in the sewer. I want to give you some recent examples, all of them involving friends of mine, which go to demonstrate how much the contempt for the Prime Minister has leached out of the political domain and into the daily lives of ordinary Australians. A few weeks ago in Darwin, my friend was picked up from her hotel by a cab. The taxi drives, driver said to her, totally out of the blue, how could you be staying at the same hotel as that lying cunt? Apparently, Julia Gillard had stayed at the same hotel the week before 
when she was in Darwin to welcome the Indonesian president. The taxi driver continued, someone should have shot her while she was here. Everyone wants to do it. And actually, to add to that, since I gave this speech, um, and that people keep have sent me a lot, lot more material, and there's one which I know you won't be able to see um, in any detail from here, but it's a picture of Julia Gillard dressed as a bird, or drawn as a bird, I should say, and the um, headline says, number one on Australia's most hated vermin list, highly venomous and willfully destructive, fat, red-headed liar, L-I-A-R, bird. Underneath it says, shoot on sight. In July in Sydney, a stall holder in the flower market at Flemington apologised to a friend of mine who was buying some flowers for having to add GST for Julia. He then followed it. <laughs> getting his taxes in his <laughs> He then followed it by saying, "We've got to get rid of the bitch." Another friend told me about an encounter his mother, whom he describes as quietly spoken and conservative looking, had at a medical office in Albury when she went to submit a form for her latest MRI. The man behind the counter said to her, unprovoked, I'll send it off to the red-haired bitch. In my remarks today, I want to focus on depictions and comments about Julia Gillard that are utterly and undeniably sexist. What I want to do is to establish the extent to which the Prime Minister is being treated unfairly as a woman and because she's a woman. I want to identify ways in which Julia Gillard, Australia's first female Prime Minister, is being persecuted both because she is a woman and in ways that would be impossible to apply to a man. We'll get started with a little trip down memory lane. Before we go tonight, so we do hear a lot of bleating in the media these days about threats to freedom of speech. People say they feel muzzled and constrained about what they can say, particularly when it comes to speaking their mind about our female Prime Minister. Yes, but there's no need to stifle free speech because I mean, we've got such responsible, even-handed broadcasters in this country who ensure that public discussion about Julia Gillard is always dignified. That is right. Straight. Absolutely. So here, as a tribute to the work of our media gatekeepers, we leave you this evening with the classic Beatles tune, Julia, accompanied by the Australian Talkback Radio Chorus. Half of what I say is meaning Clean energy future. Why does this woman hate Australia so much? But I say it just to reach you, Julia. Thank you, Julia, you imbecile. The bloody stupid, dangerous woman at the top job. A vitriolic, bitter, lying, condescending, arrogant facade of a Prime Minister. He's brain dead. He's a menopausal monster. Okay, good on you, Anita. Thank you. Take the gloves off, Tony Abbott. Stop being Mr. Nice Guy and rip and tear. We need you. I'm over this lying cow, Gillard. Or a horrible mouth on leg shit. God, thank can't we bag this woman? I mean, for goodness sake, she's out of control. Yeah. Every time she opens her mouth, it's just crap that comes Absolutely. Please, please, don't have that lying bitch on your program. This crap that is clearly a psychopath. She's going to have to be the minister by herself. Or the Australian taxpayer paying for those as well. The lying bitch is really good. It's a piece of crap. Okay, he is a lying manipulator, incompetent, communist hyena. That's the only thing I can say about Julia Gillard. This mean and tricky, venal woman. I would just like to say how fortunate for Miss Gillard that we don't have the guillotine these days. Yeah. Because I think she'd be heading to one very, very shortly. Yeah, that's it. Bring back the guillotine. I'm glad that people are angry. I'm sure that you're all familiar with these examples. I played the tape mostly to remind you of them, but also to provide a benchmark of what we used to think was awful and offensive. Sadly, things have got much, much worse in the past year. If you're anything like me, you probably had no idea that this stuff is out there. You, if you're anything like me, were probably still outraged by Ditch the Witch and the like. Now, only 18 months after that poster was first aired on national television, I have to report that that sentiment is tame compared with some of the things that are being suggested to or about the Prime Minister today. This material is distributed via a number of different means. With today's information technology, anyone can be a publisher, and thousands of us are. 
Mostly we use these tools to benign effect, to chat with friends, share photographs, exchange ideas or information, or just to add a bit of entertainment to our daily lives. But others are increasingly using these same tools to vilify, to degrade, and to undermine the authority of the office of the Prime Minister and the present incumbent, Julia Gillard. Email is one such tool. We are all familiar with chain emails. Usually they are, they are harmless and inoffensive, even if they can be annoying. But sometimes they are downright offensive. This one, for instance. This is one of the infamous cartoons sent to members of Parliament by the obnoxious Larry Pickering. I'll say a bit more about him in a moment. There are also the viral emails, the ones that people forward on and on to all their friends, mostly harmless. I get a lot of blonde jokes sent to me. But when ugly images such as this one go viral, it all adds to the overall climate of disrespect that is demeaning to and which is undermining the authority of our Prime Minister. I would argue that it's also having an impact on her personal ratings. You would be aware that while recent polls show the government gaining, Julia Gillard's personal popularity and her ratings as preferred Prime Minister are stagnant, or on some polls falling, e falling even further. Now that may be changing a little bit in the last week or two. I'm not sure what impact her speech will have on her ratings, so uh, I hope I may be wrong about that. I hope I am. But my overall point is that I think that this sort of stuff that's out there is contributing to a climate of disrespect where it's very hard to, uh, for her to have the authority that she needs to have to do her job. Is it any wonder when she's subject to this sort of thing? YouTube is another tool. Anyone can make a video and post it on YouTube. What surprises me is that ordinary people would bother to record themselves slagging off at the Prime Minister. I won't show, the, show you any examples, but you can search for them if you want to. For instance, in one such video called Creatively, Julia Gillard, the world's biggest slut, a young man who does not even have the guts to show his face, but has a scarf covering his features, says, among many other offensive things, hey, just a guess, you also do not like Julia the lying bitch. One has to rem remember that Julia has the rags on once a month. Why? Because she deserves it. That was posted in June this year. And Facebook is probably now the weapon de monde. In fact, I would say that the lethal combination of Photoshop and Facebook has taken our political discourse to places we probably did not think possible. We just saw an example of an ugly Photoshopped image that is going around on email. The extent of the distribution of similar or worse images on Facebook is so much greater because of the massive numbers involved. Facebook was expected to reach 1 billion members worldwide last month. In Australia, there are now more than, there are 11.3 million Australians on Facebook, and some figures um, published the other day said the average person spends 73 minutes a day on Facebook, compared with 75 minutes a day watching television. So the potential is there to reach very significant numbers of people using this social networking tool. And of course, a lot of companies are devoting lots of resources at present into figuring out just how to exploit the commercial potential of all this. But until I began to do the research for this lecture, I did not appreciate the extent to which Facebook is being used as a vehicle for hate speech. Julia Gillard is not the only target. There's a large amount of racist material. And I guess if one were to go looking, there would be other examples of offensive material. And I have to say, uh, someone drew my attention earlier this week to a truly horrible Facebook page about Jill Ma that some of you may have seen. Jill Ma, of course, was the young girl who was murdered in Melbourne a few weeks ago. And the things that are being said about her, and I think people like me cannot understand what, I mean, however free you want speech to be, um, some of the things that are being said on that site are so extraordinarily um, disgusting and offensive. You wonder if they do pass the free, t free speech test, but I think the way that the why they do and the reason that Facebook uh, refuses to shut down the site is because it's dubbed humour. Um, but anyway, I was looking for sites that dealt with Julia Gillard, and here are a few of the things that I found. There's a Facebook page called Julia Gillard, Worst PM in Australian History. It was established in, two, in July 2011 and describes itself in the following terms. This page is a community of people who like to take out their anger and frustration out on this useless oxygen, oxygen thief, Julia Gillard. 
our motto is friends don't let friends like Julia Gillard. This is a very busy and much visited site and it contains a great deal of material of a highly suggestive and sexual nature. I have included some of the worst examples in the appendix to this. So this speech that I'm giving, there's three versions. There's my, the vanilla version of the speech with all the images removed, which you can show your grandmother. Um, though she's probably already read the R-rated version, if the comments I'm getting are anything to go by. And then there's also an X-rated appendix, which has got the really horrible stuff in. And I certainly won't be showing you that tonight. Instead, I'll just give you a taste of some of the milder stuff. For example, sack the crack. Red Rooter, and there's you know, any number of ha-ha funny things like that. One of the features of this page is the very large number of comments that visitors make about these sexually suggestive pictures. It is not uncommon for there to be 500 or 600 comments under a single photo. Another feature of this page is to invite people to provide captions or commentary on straightforward news photos. Two such examples are the historic photograph of Governor General Quentin Bryce with Julia Gillard, just after the latter had been sworn in as Australia's first female Prime Minister, and a number of photos of Gillard with Barack Obama during the US President's visit to Canberra last year. The comments on underneath these photographs are almost without exception extremely crude, sexual, and sometimes quite violent. Those that involve uh, President Obama are often racist as well. And what makes Facebook different from email or from those hate-filled comments from cyber trolls that appear under online opinion pieces in newspapers or on the ABC is that Facebook users are much more likely to use their real names and their photographs so we know who they are. The other thing about Facebook is that we can measure what is going on. For instance, the Facebook page Julia Gillard, Worst PM in Australian History, at the time that I did this uh, speech, it might have changed since then, had 15,686 likes and 43,265 people were talking about it. That was on the 22nd of August. Uh, six days later, it had grown from 15,000 to 18,000 and there were 45,000 talking about it. Fortunately, this is way short of the 132,000 people who liked Julie Gillard on her official Facebook page. Facebook has given us new ways to intimidate, bully, harass and defame on a remarkable and previously unimaginable scale. There was another very famous Facebook page that has since been taken down. It was part of the Alf Stewart meme, a series of extremely crude pages that have taken over the persona of the hope hapless star of Home and Away and used him to promote some pretty disgusting notions. You will not be surprised to hear that most of these denigrate women and some of them actually glorify rape. The one that I'm referring to shows Alf Stewart saying, Jules, you fucking slut, on top of a photo of Gillard, which has superimposed over it the words, smash my box, Alf. Under that is another photo of Alf and the words, if I wanted a greasy red box, I'd go to KFC, you slut. This little graphic had been liked 43,253 times by the time it was taken down. Perhaps just as alarming was the fact that it had been shared by 2,099 people. If each of these people who shared it with their friends had 100 Facebook friends, the image has pot potentially been distributed to over 200,000 people. It must be very hard being Julia Gillard and knowing this stuff is out there. And I would go so far as to suggest that a lot of the anger and the passion that we saw uh, when she delivered her speech last week in Parliament was probably, or very likely, I think, informed by the fact that she has seen this material and that it has actually got to her, as it would get to any of us. This is just another one. This is in a shop window in, uh, in Queensland during the Queensland elections. But does she have any address? What are the Prime Minister's rights at work? I think it's reasonable to ask whether the Prime Minister is being treated in ways that are actually unlawful or even illegal under federal legislation designed to protect the rights of workers. But because politicians and Prime Ministers do not enjoy these rights, I want for the sake of my argument to look at the situation in a somewhat different way. Imagine that Julia Gillard is the CEO of a very large company, Australia Proprietary Limited, and imagine that all of you here today are, those, are that company's shareholders. And let's agree that the people sitting here in the front row 
are the directors of that, the, the board of directors of that company. I will now take you through your responsibilities and obligations as shareholders and directors to the CEO you have employed to run your company. There are laws passed by the Commonwealth Parliament which set the standard for conduct in the workplace as accepted by the general Australian community. They reflect the norms and expected behaviour within the vast majority of workplaces. One such law is the Federal Sex Discrimination Act of 1984. Section 5 of this Act de defines direct sex discrimination as less favourable treatment of a woman compared with a man in the same circumstances. Section 14 of the Act covers the places of employment, such as the uh, sorry covers the place of employment as the area where such a discrimination has occurred. I think we can easily conclude that any discrimination against Gillard on the grounds of her sex has occurred in the course of her employment as the CEO of Australia. What needs to be established is whether she has been subjected to any form of less favourable treatment relating to her employment because of her gender. I believe we can clearly make the case that she has been treated less favourably because of her sex. Let me give three examples where she has, in the course of her employment, been subject to comments that are both offensive per se and which relate specifically only to women. In other words, these same things could not and would not have been said of a man. First, let's recall the comments of Liberal Senator Bill Heffernan in 2007 who said, speaking of Julia Gillard, that anyone who chooses to remain deliberately barren, got, they've got no idea what life's about. Now we do not describe men who do not have children as barren. Its usage relates only to women and thus these remarks are a clear example of sex discrimination in employment. My second example comes from former leader of the Labor Party, Mark Latham, who said only last year, choice in Gillard's case is very, very specific, particularly because she's on the public record saying she made a deliberate choice not to have children to further her parliamentary career. I think, still quoting, I think having children is the great loving experience of any lifetime and by definition, you haven't got as much love in your life if you make that particular choice, he told ABC Radio. One would have thought to experience the greatest loving experience in life, having children, you wouldn't particularly make that choice. Now, I do not think that men are called upon to make choices about paternity in order to pursue careers. This is, again, a sex-specific situation, an example of a person being disadvantaged in her employment because of her sex. Can we think of any instances where a man has been asked about such choices? Both the original question to Gillard and the use put to it by a so-called commentator constitute less favourable treatment. My third example is from the Leader of the Opposition, Tony Abbott, who in February 2011 demanded Gillard that Gillard make an honest woman of herself by taking the carbon tax to an election. Of course, making, uh, using the phrase honest woman was implying that she's dishonest, but also the expression make an honest woman of refer, refers of course only to women, uh, honest woman, well, honest woman, um, but more pertinently its normal use is in relation to single women. To make an honest woman of someone usually entails a man marrying a woman who is pregnant. The use of this term in relation to Gillard was a non too subtle reminder to voters of the CEO's single status. There could perhaps even be a case here on the grounds of marital status under the Sex Discrimination Act. There are many more examples I could cite, such as the comment made in July by Kevin Rudd Backer about the time it was taking to bring Gillard down. We need her to bleed out, as this person charmingly put it. Or the recent description by David Farley, CEO of Australian Agricultural Company of Julia Gillard, as an unproductive old cow you would not call a man a cow. But I think I've made my case. No male CEO of Australia has ever been subjected to the same treatment. The Federal Magistrates Court has found that an Aboriginal man who was subjected to constant derogatory comments about his race has been discriminated against on the grounds of race. I suggest that were a case to be brought forward based on what Julia Gillard has had to endure, there would be a finding of sex discrimination. 
This then creates obligations for you, the Board of Directors of Australia Inc, Australia Proprietary Limited, to rectify the situation and to remove the discrimination or be held liable for the damages being done to her, both to her reputation and to her emotional well-being. I think we can also make the case that the CEO has been subjected to sexual harassment in her employment as set out by sections 28A and 28B of the Sex Discrimination Act. It is well accepted under the Act that the sending of sexually explicit material via email or text to a person constitutes sexual harassment. The definition also covers accessing sexually explicit internet sites. Interestingly, a recent test case under the Sex Discrimination Act as to whether exposing a worker to pornography at work constituted sex discrimination as opposed to sexual harassment and it was settled out of court. There's a huge reluctance to establish, to, to build up any case law in this area, but that's another subject. The creating of sexually explicit internet sites or contributing to ones on Facebook that I have described would easily fall within the definition of sexual harassment. I have already shown you an example from the loathsome Larry Pickering. Larry Pickering has suddenly become very famous, if not infamous, after being identified by the CEO in her press conference on Thursday the 23rd of August as someone, and she said, who publishes a vile and sexist website. Gillard said that for many, many months now I have been the subject of a very sexist smear campaign from people for whom I have no respect. What she did not say was that for many months now, Pickering has bombarded not just her, but every member of federal parliament and every senator on an almost daily basis with emails containing hate-filled commentary about Gillard. Often these commentaries are accompanied by cartoons, many of which, like the ones I have shown, depict Gillard naked and wearing a huge strap-on dildo. Pickering was infamous back in the days when he was the cartoonist for The Australian for producing annual calendars in which all the, the then all-male politicians had extremely long penises that were used to supposedly entertaining effect. It seems that Pickering cannot envisage a Prime Minister without a penis, so he had to give Gillard a strap-on. When Facebook, where he publishes all of his material now, forced him to stop drawing her this way, he started depicting her with a dildo thrown over her shoulder. And, you know, as of today, they're still there. I have seen many examples of these emails shown to me by MPs, and I know, one, that they go to every member and senator, and two, that they contain vile and disgusting images of our political leaders, most often of Julia Gillard, but also, until his resignation from Parliament, also Bob Brown. Yet they have not been denounced, in public at least, by any member of Parliament. I find this almost beyond comprehension. Nor, before Gillard mentioned them at her press conference, had they been written about by anyone in the parliamentary press gallery. Surely it is newsworthy that Australia's first female Prime Minister is under such constant illustrated atta attack. Surely it is noteworthy that the portrayals of her are obscene and indisputably sexist. Surely it would merit a report somewhere in the media by one of the journalists who churn out stories daily from Canberra and who in the past week have been reminding us ad nauseum about the context in which they report. <coughs> Instead, we have had, to, we've had what, what one might almost call a conspiracy of silence. Is it because the images are so vile that there was an implicit agreement between parliamentarians and the press to simply pretend they did not exist? Or were they just dismissed as the crazed work of a cranky old hack? I sense that many journalists in the press gallery are now somewhat embarrassed about their failure to report on and thereby smoke out these endless, vicious attacks on the Prime Minister. I want to turn now to industrial relations law. Would the, com would the CEO have any resort under the Fair Work Act 2009? Section 340 of the Fair Work Act prohibits an employer from taking adverse action against an employee, which includes discriminating against an employee while Section 351 prohibits an employer from taking adverse action against an employee because of the employee's sex or marital status. An employer can be held liable for the actions of their employees and for the way co-workers treat each other. Increasingly, industrial tribunals and commissions are having to grapple with this new
and being, are being called upon to determine where the conduct on Facebook can warrant dismissal. Already there are examples where Fair, Fair Work Australia has been cited when employees have been dismissed for acts of sexual harassment or inappropriate conduct on social media sites such as Facebook against co-workers. And this definition includes supervisors and bosses as well as more junior employees. While the tests may be different from those under sex discrimination law, there is little doubt that the type of commentary and images to which Julia Gillard is routinely and repeatedly subject, subjected would to, to would come within the type of conduct prohibited in all other workplaces. An employer would be liable to their employee and may have to pay a civil penalty, a fine under uh, section three, um, 539. Indeed, there could even be the possibility of prison. In July, a Bendigo magistrate gave a suspended prison sentence to the creator of the Facebook page, Bender's Root Rate. Yes, you did hear me correctly. And yes, it does mean what you think it means. A Facebook page in which the creators rated named people's sexual performance. Back in the 1970s, when women were for the first time getting jobs in places such as the police force, the fire brigade, BHP, and other previously all-male workplaces, it was common for these women to find pornographic photographs placed, placed inside their lockers. These were an expression of hostility on part of some of their male co-workers who apparently resented the intrusion of these groundbreaking women into what had been all-male domains. Aren't we seeing a similar process happening now? When Julie Gillard logs onto her computer and sees images of herself naked or holding suggestive signs, isn't she being subjected to similarly hostile acts by people who apparently resent her being in the job? I would say yes. I think we can fairly conclude that the CEO of Australia Propriety Limited has been subjected to both to conduct that is outlawed under both the Sex Discrimination Act and the Fair Work Australia. You, as shareholders of Australia Proprietary Limited, would expect the board of directors of the company to not just play, pay any applicable fines and damages, but to do something about changing the culture of the company that allows this kind of behaviour to flourish. The courts can make orders to stop certain conduct and order other conduct to occur, and as shareholders you could demand that directors put in place some positive actions. I hope that in making the case in this way that I have persuaded you the Prime Minister is entitled to feel aggrieved by the way she's being treated. And so are we. It says something about our country and about us that we could subject our leader to this vile abuse. It is even worse that we somehow think it is okay and even funny to demean her sexually in such crude and disgusting ways. What has happened to us? How can we account for these levels of vitriol, for this hatred? Can it really be the case that a tax, a carbon tax, could really spur so, much, so many people to such levels of hatred? I find that impossible to believe. So I have to conclude that the persecution of Julia Gillard has to be about something else. Is it just the simple fact that she's a woman? It's difficult not to conclude that we Australians are, so far at least, simply incapable of accepting a woman in charge of our country. It's worth remembering that we were one of the last countries in our region to have a female Prime Minister or President. India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, the Philippines, South Korea and of course New Zealand, who managed two, all had women leaders before we did. But surely Julia Gillard's continuing unpopularity is not just because she's a woman. It can't be because she was incredibly popular when she was Deputy Prime Minister. There are two reasons, I think, why Australians are having difficulty liking their Prime Minister. For all of our history, a Prime Minister has been a man in a suit who has been married to a woman and who has children. If our first female leader also happens to be our first unmarried, child, childless, living with a partner, not to mention atheist Prime Minister, then perhaps it's not surprising that the population is having some trouble getting their heads around this new reality. The fact that we've had 10 female leaders at state or territory level 
apparently has not adequately prepared us for this. But I think there's something else at work. And that is the deliberate sabotaging of the Prime Minister by political enemies who include people within her own party and who are using an array of weapons which include personal denigration, some of it of a sexual or gendered nature, to undermine her and her authority, to erode her authority. It was not always so. I like to quote a story that did the rounds in Sydney a couple of years ago about the hard men of the New South Wales right who got very nervous when they learnt that the then DPM, Julie Gillard, was planning to attend a big labour function in the western suburbs. How would the traditional women of the West react to Gillard, the Sussex Street boys fretted. After all, she was single, had no kids and lived with a hairdresser. <laughs> they made some inquiries and the feedback shocked them. These supposedly traditional women had no problem with Gillard's marital status envied her freedom from the responsibilities of raising children, and most of all were in awe of her for having chosen a hairdresser <laughs> for a partner. <laughs> in June 2010, in the week she became Prime Minister, Julia Gillard presided over a 14% increase in her party's vote with Labor's two-party preferred vote rising to 55% to the coalition's 45%. Julia Gillard was preferred as Prime Minister by 55% of Australians against the 34% who preferred Tony Abbott. Even more striking, as Barry Cassidy has pointed out, was the stunning turnaround in the leader's satisfaction ratings. Kevin Rudd's ratings when he was deposed had been minus 19. Within a week of becoming Prime Minister, Julia Gillard's satisfaction rating was plus 19, a 38% turnaround. It's difficult to remember back two years ago to Julia Gillard's rock star status. She was popular, even adored, and there was no doubt she was on track to lead Labor to a stunning electoral victory. And then there were the leaks. During the election campaign, several extremely damaging leaks put into the public domain by journalist Laurie Oakes alleged that in Cabinet before the leadership change, Gillard had, had opposed both the paid parental leave scheme and increases to the age pension. Nothing could have been more calculated to wound her politically. She, the childless woman, stood accused of not caring about families with children, the paid parental leave issue, and of being a heartless person who was against fairness for pensioners. Gillard's popularity dropped almost, dropped almost 20 points virtually overnight and, as we know, the government's standing was damaged. Its primary vote fell to 38% and it was unable to gain a parliamentary majority in order to govern. Gillard has never recovered from this. Her personal popularity has remained low even while the government's standing has started to improve and she will never be able to recover while a similarly brutal and targeted campaign of vilification is still being conducted against her. In 2010, it was Kevin Rudd, or his agent, who successfully struck at her credibility and her authority with those cruelly targeted leaks. In 2012, it is anyone who forwards a viral email or likes or adds a sexist comment on Facebook, who retweets a, co a crude comment or engages in casual conversations where the country's leader is dismissed as a lying bitch. It is time to stop, to draw a line. My purpose in deciding to explore these things today was not to titillate and it was certainly not to give satisfaction to the people who are responsible for producing this awful material. Some people in fact counsel me not to show it. Ignore it, delete it, don't reinforce it, I was told. Well, I disagree. I think that by shining a light on what is out there, on the ways in which our country's leader is being demeaned and destabilised and our country and its population is degrading itself, we might be able to shame the more decent among us into not going along with it anymore. We have to do this because I am alarmed that we have created a climate of misogyny that is widespread and contagious. It taints all of us, makes all women vulnerable and it is likely to act as a deterrent to young women thinking about a career in politics. 
Why would anyone want to step up for such treatment? I did take the advice to the extent that I have cut back on what I showed you today, but as I've mentioned, I'm including uh, many more examples in the, in the um, website. I was very impressed a few weeks ago when Helen Zoki, the Race Discrimination Commissioner, unveiled a strategy to end racism in this country, and she came up with the slogan, Racism, it stops with me. Simple, yet effective. I would today like for we shareholders in Australia Proprietary Limited to make a similar commitment. The persecution of our Prime Minister, it stops with me. So next time you get one of those emails, don't delete it, send it back to whoever sent it to you and tell them it stops with me. When someone in your company refers to the Prime Minister disrespectfully, don't ignore it, tell them off, it stops with me. And if you stumble across a website or a Facebook page that contains offensive commentary or images, don't avert your eyes, make a comment calmly saying how sad this makes you feel, it stops with me. This is something that is beyond party, beyond political affiliation, beyond voting intention and beyond whether or not you like Julia Gillard. We should all be worried about this vilification of our first female Prime Minister. I think the same thing would happen if she were from the Liberal Party. Indeed, Julie Bishop, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, has told me that she is constantly attacked for being childless. So it doesn't matter whether you are Labor or Liberal, National Party or Green, whether you admire Julie Gillard or whether you despise her, whether you intend to vote for her or not. If enough of us push back, perhaps we can stop it. If we can, perhaps that will help restore some dignity and respect to the holder of our highest office. We would be a better place if we could. Thank you.